I'm praying that you have been blessed by our time in Romans 5, 1 through 5. God is just so gracious that he has allowed all of the Advent themes of peace, joy, hope, and today love to be found in these five verses. If you're here with us the first week, we talked about making peace with God. And having peace with God allows us to experience and to know the um, surpassing peace of God. And this peace is not only to be temporary, but we are to lean into that peace continually by leaning into the promises of God found in Scripture. Uh, The next week we talked about this counterintuitive premise of rejoicing in our sufferings because we know that when we rejoice in our sufferings that we know that things are taking place that the Lord is doing in our life. Our faith is being strengthened, we are being sanctified, and our life in Christ is being solidified. Last week we heard from Travis as we defined hope and hope being the confident expectation to what God has promised will come to pass in the future. And we we found out and leaned into the fact that this hope that we have, a steadfast anchor for our soul, will not put us to shame. And this week, in order to give us proper context again, uh, let's go ahead and read through our our passage as far as uh, jumping into this topic of love. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And I'm just going to pause how fitting with love being our final Advent theme, this is also the final theme that Paul speaks to us of in this passage in Romans. And so we, Travis and I have thoroughly enjoyed preaching through these five verses, but I'm just as equally as excited to preach uh, on this final verse, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So before we jump in today, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, God, we just rejoice in the glory of the newborn king. God, allow this Christmas season, what has already passed, and and as we step into today, tomorrow, and this new year, God, we pray that you allow the love that has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit to be made manifest in our lives. And God, that we may know, that we may just embrace this great love that you have for us that has been graciously and generously poured out into our hearts. God, may we be able to step into this, that this love that you have given to us, may we take that same love and give it to others this time of year. And God, we love you. God, we love you because you first loved us. And God, we rejoice in this great love that you have given to us. Amen. Now, despite this being um, the first time that Paul mentions this topic of love in the book of Romans, we know that he holds this topic in high regard. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 states, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. After listing many characteristics as far as to the church of uh, Colossae, uh, to put on God's beloved chosen characteristics here, he tells, this, he tells the church, and above all these put on love, which bind, binds everything together in perfect harmony. And he also takes some time to define and describe love in a well-known verse that is read at many wedding ceremonies, going back to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things and endures all things. Ancient Greek philosophers knew this topic of love to be very significant as well. Uh, So they came up with seven different types of love. Uh, We could review these. I know this isn't a Valentine's Day message, but uh, eros, romantic, passionate love. 
Uh, Agape, unconditional, selfless love. Uh, Philia, friendship, brotherly type of love. Storgi, love for one's family or even one love for one's country. Ludus, playful, flirtatious type of love. None of that going on today here. Okay, we're at church, folks. Pragma, enduring, committed love. And philatia, love for oneself. Now, the reason I bring these up, because as we would know that the Bible is written in Koine Greek, and we want to make sure that we know what type of love that we're talking about today, and it is agape love, God's unconditional selfless love for us. And so, now, despite all of human intuition's attempts to define this worldly love that we have, they merely just scratch the surface as far as the immense colossal nature that God has his love that he has for us. He orchestrated this magnificent plan uh, of salvation where, where we as sinners, the unjust, the ungodly, have been reconciled to him and we are now anchored to him in his love. But this love that we speak of today, it's so much more richer. It's so much more grand. It's so much more expansive than we could even get our minds wrapped around. It is unequaled. It is unparalleled. It does not falter. It does not fail. It does not flounder. It is steadfast. Whereas the world's love is limited, God's love is unlimited. Whereas the world's love is finite, God's love is infinite. Whereas the world's love is temporary and, and transient, God's love is eternal. And not only do we have this love that God has for us, he has not only so graciously given it to us, as we see from our passage today, he pours this out into our hearts. Now we know as followers of Christ that there are so many verses that speak into God's love found in his word. And as we just reviewed, God's love is indeed all of these things. But, but I just wanted to break things down a little bit further here. And I want to put some of those proclamations, some of those declarative proclamations of God's love that he has for us aside. They're of utmost importance we would arrive at, obviously. But, but I wanted to look at this love from a mere rational logical and point of reason perspective for a time here. And the reason I want to do this is because we need to allow and know what God's love actually is and why it is so much more different than any type of worldly love we will experience. And, and when we know and understand this type of love, then as we will see through the Holy Spirit, this love is able to be poured out into our hearts, which leads to a transformative work in our lives. And so that's where we're going today. And so point number one is what makes God's love so much more meaningful than worldly love? Uh, why is it so much more different than worldly love? We could look to all of these things that we find in Scripture, yes and amen, but let's break it down even a little bit further here. Because I think, and I think many of you would agree with this, if you really look into the depths of who we are at times, I would say that many of us have a hard time not only comprehending this type of love, but many of us in this room have a hard and difficult time receiving this type of love. And we may have this head knowledge we might know what Scripture says as far as God's love is concerned, but there is a disconnect that exists, and we may at times have a difficult time allowing us to really truly embrace this great, great love that God has for us. And so let's consider three things that make God's love so much more meaningful than worldly love. First of all, let's consider the source the source of the love. Now, I think we would all agree on the fact and how God created us that we all love to be the recipient of love, right? Now, if we just really think about some of those that are nearest and dearest to ourselves, like maybe it's close friends or, or family members or, or parents or, or, or kids, 
acquaintances, a, a spouse. When the, they convey love to us, that is something that is very treasured. That is something that is very cherished. If you're married in this room, a mere heartfelt I love you can go a very, very long way because you know the depth of what that means when you truly say that in an intimate way. The expression of love that is given from a parent to a child or, or a child to a parent, regardless of the age, is, is something that is very much appreciated. We know this because when one's life is void of this love and care, then we could see some of the negative ramifications that could take place in, in lives. Now, if you're here in this room and you have kids, if you could, maybe they're little right now, maybe they're little one day or in the past, and you know, nothing, or even if you have grandkids, nothing is as heartfelt as I, I love you, mama, or I love you, daddy, right? Or if you have grandkids, nana, papa, you know, those are some things that can go a long way. My boys are a little bit older, so it's kind of like a, hey, love you, man, you bro hug, and it's like they're tall, so I gotta like, you know, so, but, but those things are very, very important. And now as special and as meaningful as these types of worldly love is or are, it is merely an expression of human love that, that, that pales in comparison to God's great love that he has for us. And now, and as special and as meaningful as these things are, what really puts things in perspective when we uh, relate it back to the source of this love is what we need to do and what we need to get our minds wrapped around when we consider the source of the love is who God is. Because when we recognize who God is in, in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor, then we have an understanding that this love is coming from something and someone completely different than anything we will ever experience in this world. And it is coming into the fact that recognizing who God is that changes our perspective on this love that has been given to us. It should affect how we view this love. Why? Because the God and creator of the universe and the God and creator of you has said, I love you. I love you. Lamentations 3, 19 through 23. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind. This I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. You see, the source of the love does indeed affect the meaning of the love. And when we embrace the enormity of who God is, then we could step into and embrace this great love that he has for us. The second aspect that makes God's love much more meaningful than worldly love is this. Consider the sacrifice of his love. What is given up for love? Uh, the greater the sacrifice, the greater and more meaningful is the love. In, in this specific instance, actions speak much louder than words. Now, when we think about some relationships that we might have, we, we give of our time, we, we give of our resources, we give of our affections, and these are some things that we would consider when we think about things that we love. But when is the last time you have had to consider giving up your life for this love. I mean, that puts things in a, an entirely different category. And not only did Christ give up his life for you and I, he was perfect and blameless in the whole process. He was sinless. He, he took on sin 
so that we would not know sin. And he did these things when we were the guilty, perpetrating party, undeserving of this love. But because of this, Christ died for us. As we see in verse 6, Christ died for the ungodly. And in verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so when we look at this, the sacrifice that was given here, we are looking at the pinnacle of cost. We are looking at the pinnacle of sacrifice. And so this is something else that we should consider when we're talking about how much more meaningful God's love is for us than worldly love. Consider the sacrifice of the love, the greatest sacrifice. It is unparalleled. And then thirdly, consider the significance of the love. In other words, this. What is it that we receive from this love? What is it that we are given? Well, we are given everything. Everything. The enormity of this gift and just the ability to think about what has been given to us is incomprehensible. And this is the hope that we hold fast to. The confident expectation to what God has promised will take place in the future. And what has God promised? And if you recall the central theme in our study through 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. We are given riches for all of eternity that we can't even, with our finite minds, even begin to think about. But not only that, this eternal, unfading, imperishable, undefiled hope that awaits us, we also can experience the goodness and the richness and the depths of God here in this life before, before we see him face to face. And so when we have a greater knowledge of God's love with these things, through the source, through the sacrifice, through the significance of God's great love for us, what this allows us to do, it allows us to step into it even more deeply. And what if this is to do, this is to elicit a response within our very heart and soul. Point number two is this, the knowledge of God's love is to elicit a response to God's love. The knowledge of God's love is to elicit a response to God's love. The knowledge in our head is to produce an affection in our heart. It, it needs to go from this cognitive, intellectual knowledge to an emotional, heartfelt response. And I use the word emotional because this is what this verse speaks to. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts, poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When we see words like this poured into the heart God is speaking through the Apostle Paul that this love is relational. This love is intimate. This love is visceral. This, this love is much more deeper than just having a little bit of head knowledge. This love is experiential. And some may hear some of those words and you might want to run for the hills. We'll get to that in a second. But what I love about this verse and these words that Paul uses is where we're going to camp out for just a second. Is that we see this word poured out, echeo, in the Greek. It means bestow, largely distribute, to gush. In other words, God's love for us does not come in the form of an eyedropper, does it? I mean, he's not saying deem. I'm going to give you just a little trickle of my love today, one drop at a time. 
God's love has been lavishly poured out over us. It is just an overwhelming flood. And this is why it's so important that we talk about this. Because how little do we see and know and embrace about the enormity of God's love for us. It is to permeate within our very soul. It is the Niagara Falls of love. Or better yet, let's keep it local. It is the Shoshone Falls of love here, right? And so Danielle took that picture. So, But this is where I want us to really lean in here. What is the mechanism that we are to receive this love? What does the verse say? It says, through the Holy Spirit of God. This is how the head knowledge, this is how the head knowledge goes to a response in our hearts. It is through the power, it is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the Holy Spirit that prepares the hearts to receive God's love. It is the Holy Spirit that prepares the hearts to receive God's love. It is the Holy Spirit that does the work of the Father. It prepares the hearts of men in order for this great love to be received. And this is not only the first time we see the Apostle Paul talk about the topic of love in the book of Romans, but this is also the first time that we see Paul reference the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. And just another blessing from these five verses found in Romans 5, that we have not only been able to see the four Advent themes of hope, peace, joy, and love, but we've also been able to step in and see the amazing Trinity at work in our midst. Our first verse, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now our verse today, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And also if we lean into this verse, what is the word that we see after the Holy Spirit in our text today? What is that word? It says who. Who. It does not say what. It says who. The Holy Spirit is a person. It is the third person of the Trinity. It is not an energy source as Jehovah Witnesses would believe. It is not the angel Gabriel, which we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, as Muslims would believe. It is not a spirit child born to Heavenly Father as Mormons would believe. This is the third pre-existent person of the Trinity that resides in the life of every believer and is given to every believer at the moment of conversion. Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. We get the package deal. But when we step into a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is there at the moment of conversion. Yes, there may be specific indwellings of the Holy Spirit throughout the life of a believer. And there are times in which we are to pray to God for the Holy Spirit to be more evident or more manifest in our lives in various ways. But as we see from this passage, it is something that has been given to us. He was doing the work leading up to your conversion and at the time of your conversion. When you crossed from death to life, from darkness to light, the Holy Spirit came and now abides in you. No man can say that Jesus is the Christ unless the Holy Spirit opens his eyes and reveals the truth to him. No man can arrive at the fact that he is the object of this eternal and divine love being poured into his heart. Exactly what we've been talking about today. Unless the revelation of the Spirit has been made clearly known to him. And this is important. Why is all of this important? Because it is through the Spirit that we are able to step into and really embrace the gravity of the love that God has for us. This is where we need to reside. It is impossible to see the weight and the magnitude of God's love that he has for us without the Holy Spirit. And today we need to pray to God the Father 
that through the Spirit that he would open our eyes to experience this type of love. And yes, I use the word experience. And earlier, I used the word emotional. And to be perfectly honest with you, they aren't some of my most favorite words. Like, show me truth, doctrine, and theology all day long. But when we look at this verse, these are the words that we see. There has to be so much more than this intellectual head knowledge of God's love. There exists a relational intimate reality of God's love that he has for us. And I know in my heart of hearts, and I'm not saying I'm the litmus or anything, but I know that there are times in my life where I have a hard time embracing and receiving the love of God that he has for me. And I know that there are many in this room that are at that same place. And it's my prayer that we step into this this Advent season to know how much God loves us. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I would have just loved if it was taste and see and feel that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. But the fact of the matter is this. For many of us, there is just this disconnect. There is a disconnect that finds ourselves at this place where we don't allow ourselves to be a recipient of this great love. I mean, it could be a number of things. You know, I've kind of made a mess of things, right? I've made some bad decisions. Or I, I haven't made some decisions. Or, or maybe there's just some trials that have taken place in, in my life. And it's just so difficult to get my head out of the muck and to look up to the Lord and actually say that there's a God in heaven who reigns above that loves me. Because you're probably saying, if he loves me so much, why are all these miserable things happening to me? How can God love someone that is so unlovable? And I've got to be honest with you, and I've got to be honest with myself, and I have to be honest before the Lord and say, right now, this Christmas season, I am in desperate need of this love that you speak of today. A little bit after the prophet Micah prophesies that the Lord will come forth from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he states this, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And if you're here today and if you feel like Man, this has just been a season of despair. You need to hear that you're loved. God delights in his steadfast love over you. And maybe you're here today and say something along the lines of, you know what, I don't really like messages like this. You're kind of getting into my space, John. In fact, you probably might even be saying, you're kind of getting a little sappy on me today too. And maybe that's just because the way the Lord made you or or I is our genetic makeup, how I'm built. I'm just an analytical person. And this type of love was never modeled for me growing up. And I just don't really see the great need or, or the big fuss of why we need to really step into this. It's just a whole lot of emotion. But there is a great need that we step into this. Yes, we are not to be subservient to our emotions. It's just funny for those of you that are familiar with psychology, the whole cognitive behavioral, uh, you know, therapy. They just get this from Paul. Just uh, allowing our our thoughts to direct our our emotions and and our actions. Uh, What does he tell us in Philippians 4, 8? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is 
pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, he states, think of these things. Think about these things. But the Lord gave us emotions. He gave us emotions to be able to know and see and respond to our relationship with him. And maybe the roadblock that is preventing some of us from stepping into embracing this great love that God has for us is that any time things like this pop up or any time difficult times and seasons take place in your life, all we do sometimes is just stuff it away. Everything's fine. I'm good. Just compartmentalize it to a place where real issues are, are never truly addressed. And maybe you go down that road because there is a time and a place or relationship in your life where, where there was a betrayal. There was now all that resides in that place when I need to step into some of these things, some of these dark places in our heart, mind, and soul. All that is there is hurt, anger, despair. And, and it keeps some of us at this place of isolation. It, it, it keeps us at a place where we are not the recipients of God's love pouring into some of these places that we so desperately need him to step into. And whether you realize it or not, you need to know that you are loved. You are loved and allow the knowledge of God's love through the Holy Spirit to bring forth the affections in your heart. And maybe for many of us, we're kind of at a, a space somewhere in between to various measures. We're just too busy. We, we don't take the time to contemplate this love because we just don't actually have the space in our lives to do so. Or maybe it's something along the lines of uh, you drift your thoughts towards, you know, God is just too busy. He just has too many things going on uh, to really care about little old me, right? And, and I would say that this isn't necessarily a bad mindset to take because uh, culture and this world and our sinful bent <laughs> They all make too big of a deal of ourselves. We are not the center of every environment that we walk into. But many of us in this room, especially this Christmas season, where you might have a little pocket of time in your life, many of us just need to take some time and to allow God to sit us down. To allow God to pour his love into our hearts through the knowledge that he has given us in our heads. The depravity of the human condition is not going anywhere. Each and every day we're going to fall miserably short in 101 different ways. This is why our dependence and reliance on God is so important. Because this great, agape, unconditional love does not change. It is not dependent on the things that we do and the things that we don't do. His love for us is infinite. Regardless of the circumstances that are going on in your life right now, do not deprive yourself of this great love that God has for you. Step into it. Be the recipient of God's love being poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. And finally, what is the charge after all of this? Point number four, allow God's love to be poured into your heart so that you may pour this same love into the hearts of others. And just in review, allow this Advent season that we may 
have made peace with God so we may experience the peace of God. Uh, Allow us to rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, Allow us to hold fast to the steadfast anchor of, of hope that we have been given. And allow us to receive this agape unconditional love that has been poured into the hearts through the Holy Spirit. And why? Why are we to do this? So that we may be set forth on mission. So that this love that we have had poured into our hearts, we may now take and extend to others that so desperately need to see and hear and know and feel this type of love. God's not doing any work on an empty tank. A car's not going anywhere on an empty tank of gas. But be the recipient of this love today. So that you may extend this great love to others. And that might mean something as simple as inviting someone to a Christmas Eve service tonight at 5 o'clock. And just remember, we always have people that would love to pray with you. And so if God is speaking in your heart, I just... uh, There are people here that would love to pray with you. And uh, let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's pray. Lord, this great love that you have for us can often and so easily be so overlooked. But you tell us, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. God, you have poured out this great love to us, for us, and God, through us. May we shine the light of Christ at this time and season when your light shines the brightest to those that need to hear it the most. God, may you continually pour out this great love to us Lord wherever we're at allow us to realize how desperately in need of that we are in ourselves God you have created us to receive this love so Lord we pray that we do just that today God we thank you for all the amazing riches that you give us not only in this age but the one to come We ask these things in your name.